Hi, Leandro. Hi, Alan. So today my guest is Leandro Coelho. He's an associate professor at Laval University in Quebec City, Canada. Uh, he also holds the Canada Research Chair in Integrated Logistics. He published many, many papers using exact heuristic uh, approaches for many optimization problems arising in transportation and logistics. So, Leandro, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, tudo bem? How are you? Tudo bem. Thanks for the invitation, Anand. Yeah, everything's fine here. What about you? Yeah, it's okay here. Uh, so, is it very cold there? Yeah, so yesterday and today we had some very, very cold day. The temperature, the, the feel like temperature was uh, minus 33 last night. Wow. <laughs> it's quite cold. Yeah. Hey, I guess you're used to nowadays, but still uh, it's it's pretty cold. <laughs> so why well, I don't think anyone can get used it to minus yeah. 33. <laughs> uh, right. So why don't you start telling me about your early days in Santa Catarina here in Brazil? Yep. So uh, I come from the south of Brazil. Um, nice place. I miss it very much. It's been a long time. I don't I don't go there. Well, a long time, more than a year now. But I don't go there or I don't go anywhere, actually. <laughs> um, and um, it was there that I studied my undergrad, MBA and master's before I, before I decided to fly away and uh, move to Canada. Right. So what motivated you to choose uh, your undergrad? Uh, as far as I'm aware, it was in industrial engineering, right? Yes, indeed. I, I had decided it long ago uh, during my, my teens that uh, I wanted to go for an engineering school. Um, we have a quite good engineering school in Santa Catarina in Florianópolis. And uh, I chose uh, industrial engineering which in our place is not a pure industry, it's uh, combined with uh, one of the classical specializations. We have a local civil or mechanical slash industrial engineering. So I went for the electrical, which means that I had the basic training to become an electrical engineer. Uh, I was affiliated for a while. Uh, I was, um, how do you say it? Well, I could work formally as an electrical engineer for a time. Uh, Never did, but uh, I could. I see. Uh, so, do you have any research research experience uh, during your undergrad? No, definitely not during the undergrad. I had lots of experience in uh, practical settings, consulting companies, and uh, governmental types of uh, internships as type of consulting. Uh, but uh, no, definitely not research. It was very applied actually uh was which, which which actually it uh, it kind of uh, framed my my current uh contributions and research and interest which is still very applied so i think that comes from those early years early 2000s uh during the undergrad yeah uh so these experiences were through internships Yes, different types of uh, internships uh, with uh, companies, either um, internships for which you got credits for or just something you did on the side to help pay the bills and then get some money. Uh, but uh, I had uh, quite a few exposures to different applications of industrial engineering in, uh, in practice. All in Florianopolis, right? All of them in Florianopolis, yes. Uh, are you originally from Florianópolis or some other town in Santa Catarina? No, I'm from a smaller town in the south called uh, Tubarão, two hours away by car from to, to Florianópolis. Ah, okay. Uh, but did you move to Florianópolis uh, for the undergrad or before? For the undergrad, yes. I moved to the Florianópolis is the capital of the state, so I moved to the capital uh, for the for my uh, university studies. Right. So your parents are still living in Tubarão? No. So that's the funny thing. A few years, actually, I moved to the capital. They loved it so much. They moved to Florianópolis. Ah. Now they live there. <laughs> and uh, now life is based in Florianópolis. Um, they, 
they don't have any idea well, sorry they don't have any any intention to move move away from that city yeah it's a very beautiful which is a beautiful city. city yeah very beautiful city yeah agreed totally totally uh you, do you have any siblings brothers sisters yes i have a younger sister okay who also went on to to do her own phd <laughs> great um so when was your first contact with or then well in the in the undergrad course uh, we do have war as one of the courses in industrial engineering uh, we have a first course in war which covers linear programming and integer programming and then a second one with uh, some stochastic optimization q models and uh, things about that things like that but it's pretty much it uh, two pretty much standalone courses, uh, extremely difficult. Uh, at least it was for me at the time, very, very difficult, complicated, and not my favorite ones, I have to say, <laughs> uh, which I, I kind of regret now. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so at that time, I knew what was OR and I knew about this optimization thing. Uh, then later in the masters, uh, again some courses, and then finally in the PhD where I, I finally learned <laughs> something, something else. Okay, so you mentioned that you had the courses like standalone uh, subjects. So when you took uh, logistics or production management courses, they were not uh, connected with OR at all. Then in your case, no, no, uh, they were very much connected to OM, to operations management and to, to the soft side of, uh, of management, but uh, not very much linked to mathematics and uh, precise uh, decision making with the help of formal tools as we have in uh, operations research, um, which uh, in hindsight is a pity actually. Uh, I think that our, we, we can do uh, lots of help uh, with uh, OR tools to this practical problems and help management and help decision making. Um, but uh, we can talk more about that later. <laughs> yes, I, I had similar experience. Uh, I also had courses on OR, but at the time uh, I was actually very busy uh, also taking other courses at the same time. So it was kind of hard to actually dedicate time to, to that particular course. but. I also missed uh, the link with uh, other subjects in industrial engineering. I think this is this happens in other universities as well, uh, in Brazil at least. And sometimes I have the feeling that to learn that you you, uh, you the only way or the the most usual way is through masters and even PhD. But I think that many practitioners uh, they're not actually interested in, in in doing in going all the way there. And they, maybe they miss, yeah. uh, even during the undergrad period, uh, an, a great opportunity to uh, learn and, you know, uh, get more deep knowledge about OR and uh, similar subjects. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, looking back, I think that uh, back in the time, we, we, in general, people who are in, in undergrad studies in that area, maybe we are too young and too immature to understand the importance of that. And also because there, there is a lack of visibility going forward. In the first years of engineering, you take a ton of courses in math and physics. One of these math courses you take is linear algebra. If I had known, I would have invested myself a lot more in linear algebra at the time. But uh, for me, it was just playing with matrices and computing stuff for which I had no clue what would be the use for that. Um, so a few years later, that became useful in OR, but I didn't have quite the background I should have had to enjoy and to appreciate OR. And also um, something else is that uh, sometimes OR is thought as a math course, not as an applied subject with the real life impact and with uh, implications out there. Uh, so when when you're teaching that for the first time, I think it's important to give this this meaning to, to what you are doing and uh, not just 
inverting matrices and applying simplex iterations for the sake of doing it. But uh, show me with uh, applications uh, the meaning of that and uh, the impact that that can have in companies out there. Absolutely. I think there's a huge gap between theory and practice and it's it's a very challenging task to try to decrease that gap and maybe encourage the students to to uh, try to study more those topics right uh, the OR topics and uh, I feel that it's 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 a very difficult uh, task for the for the professors in general and even the the students uh, they get uh, sometimes uh, attracted to easier subjects, if you will, and uh, maybe they just realize the importance later and maybe sometimes it's too late already to, to get back and to learn because you have to put a lot of effort, right? Uh, yep, no, I totally understand. I am one of those cases that realized the importance <laughs> and the relevance of war uh, quite late in my career. Uh, hopefully I had the chance to do it again. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that was my first experience. It was back in the undergrad, and uh, at that time, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't see it the way I see it now. Yeah. Uh, what about masters? Uh, when did you realize? Oh, I, I think I'm going to do masters. Or did you have any good motivation for that? Yeah. Or? So not at first. No, I, I was quite happy with my undergrad. I went uh, to work. I worked at a bank for two years, uh, really? and uh, while yes, uh, while doing that, yes, I could I could have could have made a career that you know I could have still been there, <laughs> but uh, well, luckily not. Um, while working at the bank, I didn't want to get too far away from the university, so I pursued a, an MBA at night, a year and a half of MBA. And then when the MBA finished, I still had half a year at the bank, right? And uh, I wasn't quite happy. It didn't challenge me. Like, well, the way that we are, we use it to it, you know, academically, scientifically. And uh, I talked to my parents about it. I said, look, I know it's a stable career. I could retire working at the bank, but uh, maybe that's not what I want. And then they fully supported me to go for it. So I decided I wanted to do a master's. So that was the it. I wanted to do a master's. Um, so I went back to the university. Um, yeah, and look how things uh, turn out to be. Uh, at the time, I was quite still with the management perspective on industry engineering, the OM, the soft side, if you will. And then I went to uh, an administration faculty. In, in, in Brazil, which is quite different from administration faculties elsewhere, for sure, which is completely soft management, yeah. right? Um, I talked to some people there. I talked to some, some of my old professors in the industry engineering department, and then uh, I decided to go for the masters in industry engineering with a focus on transportation and logistics. That was specialization, and uh, in that, my focus was on logistics, but uh, not from an OR perspective, still I uh, was quite stubborn <laughs> or <laughs> I didn't have the right opportunity perhaps, but uh, uh, my, my master's was using, was on applying econometric tools to, was, my, my supervisor was an econometrist, uh, he is an econometrist and uh, we, we were using, look, you know this uh, quality control tools in which you, you assess statistically if a process is still under control. So we use this type of tools, statistical tools, to, to evaluate the quality of a forecast, to identify if a model that is providing you with forecasts is no longer representative of what uh, it's supposed to model. So when should you reevaluate your forecasting model? So we evaluated the results of a model, of a forecasting model with quality control tools, all from a very statistical perspective. So that was my, my master's. Um, and uh, one of my first courses in the master's actually was an OR course, was another OR course, <laughs> where we briefly saw again LP, 
integer programming and uh, in the in the in the masters and i remember it very well i don't know why but that thing stuck in my head i remember very well Karish and Tucker conditions I had that as a first course in the masters and somehow I remembered this kind of things and uh, the professor the or professor in the master is a good friend until now and uh, we have uh, we have uh, lots of good time chatting about uh, about all this I see uh, so you you were exposed again to R but you did not fall for for that at that time <laughs> not again <laughs> not again i had the the second chance and i missed it again yeah strike two <laughs> indeed indeed strike two yeah um uh, for your masters you did not uh need to code right it i suppose i assume uh, not code the way we code not uh, in our coding but i used the r ah, the used software R. for statistical analysis mm -hmm. so I didn't have to really code very hard, but I, I had to use R quite a lot. Okay, so it took two years for you to complete a master's? Yeah, a bit less. 18, 20 months, 20 months, give or take. Mm. And uh, it was during the master's, this is uh, interesting, well, at least it's interesting, because <laughs> uh, that's how things turned out for me. And, uh, during the masters, I decided to learn a new language for the sake of it. And then I enrolled in French courses at night with my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, uh, and some friends actually. Even friends from the bank, actually. Friends <laughs> from the bank, they enrolled with the French courses with us. Yes, now I remember that. Uh, and then I had uh, oh, twice a week, uh, one and a half hours of French courses basic level you know, from, from ground from, from level zero and at the end of the first year of the masters we had summer vacation and um, i had the opportunity i had the chance actually to say look i i, I never had an experience abroad never lived abroad and uh, maybe this summer vacation is my it's my chance so i decided i would enroll in one of these international schools to language schools and i said okay i'm going to learn uh, french and then uh, i'm going to enroll in one of these schools for a month to take intensive courses uh, morning and afternoon for a month and uh, living with a family you know like uh, like people i don't know if they use it they still do it but uh, people use it to do that time then i said all right so let's do that i will learn french for for a month either in paris or montreal so these were my two options i don't know why i chose montreal and then uh, so so it happened i went to montreal for a month in the summer vacation and um, learned french well accelerated learning french I cannot say you i cannot say i learned yeah. french but i continued learning French and I said well since I'm here since I was going to be in Montreal for a month I said why not visit some universities right I'm doing a master's maybe I want to do a PhD maybe Montreal would be the place to try it. well I will be there it costs nothing so let's try and then uh, I wanted to st still continue doing a forecast for supply chain some integrated kind of thing and then I started sending out some emails uh, look, I'm, uh, I'm this, I'm doing this, I will be there, and uh, I would be interested in talking about a possibility for a PhD. So I sent out a few emails, and then uh, half, uh, half of the answers never arrived. Some of the answers said, no, I'm on sabbatical, no, I don't have the funds, no, I'm not accepting PhD students, no, talk to this guy, and then I wrote to the guy, talk to this guy, you know, and then I sent out a few dozen emails. Four people accepted to meet me, actually. Um, so when I was there, I met these people individually. And uh, one of these people was, uh, you know, talk to this guy. And then the guy said, talk to this guy. <laughs> one of these people was this guy named Gilbert Laporte. Yeah. I I I'm not I sure have. I heard. Uh, I don't know who it is. <laughs> I had no 
clue. It was just another guy for another email I sent. I was nice enough to say, yeah, come over on this day and we're, we're going to have lunch together. Right? So let's do that. I go there. I meet the guy. I go to his office. Nice guy. Pleasant. And then uh, we go out for lunch. And they say, look, I'm doing this. I'm doing forecast in the supply chain. And I can evaluate if a forecast is good or if it's time to change the model and so and so. I said, mm, no, we don't do that in our group. Said, OK, well, I tried. So let's enjoy lunch with the guy. And then during lunch, for some reason, we talk again about what I do and what I intend to do and what he does and where there could be potentially maybe, you know, a link. And then the guy says, this Jugar Laporte guy says, um, OK, you can you can apply for a PhD. I'm going to be your supervisor. Good. Just like that. Super happy. Super happy. Super happy, yes. So I knew the guy was doing some optimization. He was doing vehicle routing. And so it was a bit different from what I used it to do. And I go back to, 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 to Brazil to continue my master's. And then I go talk to my optimization professor. Say, look, I'm going to do a PhD in Montreal with this guy called Gilbert Laporte. <laughs> so people were crazy. And then uh, they made me realize the, how deep the rabbit hole is, you know? Yeah. Uh, or they tried to make me realize, uh, which was quite a nice experience. Uh, to leave at the time, finished my master's, moved back to Montreal at the end of the year, started my PhD next January, supervised by Joubert and uh, Jean-François Cordeau at uh, HEC Montréal. Yeah, that's a huge privilege. Uh, when you were doing master's, uh, were you still working uh, in a bank, at the bank, or you no. quit? No, I quit the bank to, to dedicate myself to master's. I had a scholarship, a public scholarship. Right. To, to study. So you're studying uh, forecasting, uh, econometrics, stuff like that. And out of the balloon, you switch to optimization and to work with one of the top guys in the world. And uh, did you realize that you could be screwed or <laughs> that you, you have a huge challenge ahead at the time? Uh, I quickly realized the challenge was quite uh, quite something uh, you know uh, I would have to, to double chew um, when I started the, the PhD uh, some of your other uh, guests here have mentioned uh, some of these courses in Montreal can be quite advanced and uh, my first class was with uh, Francois Soumy from the uh, Ecole Polytechnique that was the hardest course in my in my phd in, in, my, in my program and it was the, the very first one uh in french of course and uh yeah i can't say i <laughs> i spoke french at the time definitely not i could understand i could follow but uh well Everybody was quite open in discussing and talking to me in English and allowing me to, to do homework and uh, exams in English and so. But uh, during that, uh, that first year, things got uh, scary. Things got really scary. Uh, well, I didn't have the background in OR, as I explained. And then I was doing OR with some of the top guys in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, so do, they, they don't do so, so they don't do just enough, you know, so they are the top guys in the field. And uh, I was there in the middle. Uh, it, it was quite hard, I have to say, uh, sometimes depressing. <laughs> I had some great support from my wife who at the time then moved to, to Canada with me. She was also doing her own PhD but in her field. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, well, she supported me, and uh, my my supervisors su supported me. They helped me, and uh, after some time, I found my ways. Uh, but I can't say it was easy. 
Yes, uh, starting a PhD uh, there uh, without proper background and you're not even coding, uh, I mean, you're not used to code uh, optimization algorithms. How was your programming training by then? I don't want to say absent, let's say very, very basic. Very, very basic. Um, in my undergrad, we had uh, some uh, algorithms and uh, implementation classes, but we used Pascal. Mm. Uh, and uh, in OR, you want to do things in C++, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I had... Uh, I had some, well, there was a, this is a, the good point of having this group of people working together and uh, I shared an office with uh, Claudio, Claudio Contardo. Ah, great. We interviewed already. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we, we shared an office. Uh, many people there helped me at the time. Um, so Claudio helped me a lot, actually. Uh, some other people who helped me a lot, I can mention um, Gladstone, who is now in, in Rio. Mm. Um, he, he was there in Montreal at the time doing his own postdoc and uh, he also helped me a lot. Uh, and then uh, with uh, different types of people helping me, uh, I managed to learn how to do things. I, cannot, I, I learned how to code, but uh, the computer was doing stuff that I wanted it to do sometimes. Uh, sometimes it was doing stuff on its own, but uh, that's how that's how things started moving. Yeah, uh, I wonder how did you manage then? Uh, right, I know it's you, you. You mentioned all the support, but still, something has to come out of you, right? Uh, and probably a lot of willpower, discipline, uh, work ethic. Yes, uh, it's uh, hard work. Uh, sometimes uh, not so much sleep. Uh, lots of discipline. Uh, help or do not uh, do not I don't want to, to to minimize how important help is in the sense of unity and uh, belonging to this group and uh, people who, who share their experience who share how to do it and uh, where do you where do you should go and how you should do it and so and so um, but uh, yes I cannot say it was easy but uh, doing a PhD is not supposed to be easy, right? Right. Yeah. You, you get you, you get a degree that uh, has to be worth something, and you have to work for it. So I don't think it's supposed to be easy. Mm -hmm. I think you're supposed to work for it, and uh, I'm uh, I certainly worked for mine. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and then you survived the courses. Uh, I survived all the courses. I didn't fail. Yeah, that's that's important, and so in, during that the was my first goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So during your second year is when you actually started doing research, for for doing for research. It? Yes, that's when you start doing research after you finish your courses and you pass your exam. Uh, then um, quite early we realized that uh, I had this uh, logistics background with some infantry management that's where I used to apply my forecasting tools and so and they had this transportation core and they said well let's combine uh, transportation with inventory and there is this problem that it's, it's called inventory routing I think it's made for you but all right let me take a look at it <laughs> so that's how I that's how the topic of my thesis was uh, chosen. It was very early on. And then uh, I said, all right, all right, so that's what we want to do. That's the problem we want to attack. So we have to design an optimization algorithm. We have benchmark instances, and uh, basically we have to beat the results out there. That's your first goal. All right, let's do it. And then uh, the same thing that happened to Claudio, he, he told to hear this story happened to me. When you're writing your results, a paper comes out and your results are no longer as good. <laughs> and, uh, and then it, we were playing cat and mice uh, with uh, the group from uh, Brescia in Italy, basically. It was uh -huh. us and them uh, solving the same classical instances and uh, beating each other results. And uh, that's it. So 
I wrote to this papers uh, on inventory routing that uh, became my thesis. Right. Your first journal paper uh, was only uh, from the PhD or you published before any results from your master's? No, in the master's I only published in conferences and uh, not really, nothing international. So scientifically speaking, my, my contributions started in the PhD. Okay. Uh, are we talking about 2009 or something? Uh, 2009, it's when I start my PhD. So my first paper comes out in 2011 or 12 or so. So 2009, I took courses. 2010, you start doing research. 2011, you submit your first paper. Yeah, probably it appeared 2012, my first paper on computers and operation research. Yeah, mine as well uh, was uh, international paper was also in, in uh, CNOR. Uh, yeah, uh, I remember uh, around 2012 or, or 2014, something like that. I I, I noticed that you you were you were you were like a machine, right? so you started publishing quite a bit. And at first uh, glance, I thought, who's this guy? Is it is he a, because I, from the name, I, I thought you're like from Portugal, not even from Brazil, because usually, you know, you meet people at our local conf our Brazilian conference, right? That uh, SBPO, and. I never heard of you. And then suddenly you were publishing uh, papers in, in, in OVRP problems and all that. And then I got confused. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, how, how is this possible? I, I, where this, this where this guy come, can come from? So uh, now the mystery is solved for me. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's nice. Uh, but then... Yeah, so that that's why I didn't... Uh, I, never, I never attend the... Uh, a conference in Brazil in OR because I wasn't working in OR. It was uh, it, it happened to me in Montreal only. Yeah, um, and, and also it's a pity because then I didn't know people like you and the, our our community in Brazil. I also didn't know them. I happened to meet them now several years later, where when I come back and then they invite me to visit them at their university or they send some students here to to work with me. That's how I, I get to meet the, the, the OR community in, in Brazil. Uh, I also feel like an outsider. <laughs> yeah, but after you started uh, publishing, it, it just went on and on, right? Uh, I think you, you have definitely the knack for it. And at the same time, can you tell me the experience of working with uh, two great guys, like Professor Laporte and Professor Kudo? Look, these people, they are brilliant. There is, there is no other word to describe. They are brilliant at what they do. You know, they have an eye, they have the will, they have the, they have these skills. They teach you how to, how to attack the problem, how to look at it, how to analyze the results. And to look at the results, you go back to your algorithm and you say that if you improve here and there, things will get better at the other end of the line. Uh, they are fantastic and then uh, when it comes so you do all that you design your algorithm you implement you run you analyze results you rerun and so and so and so you write that beautiful report that, uh, you very carefully put things in place you deliver it to them and then it comes back bleeding red <laughs> on their pants what have i done they said no it's it's all right so do it as i say and give it back to me. So I said, all right, I do it as they say. Now I say, all right, it's finished. And then I give it back to them and it comes back bleeding again, you know. <laughs> and uh, the thing goes on for 10, 12 rounds. But this is something I learned as well, to, to, to be extremely careful of what you write. Every word has to be a meaning, has to have a purpose to be there. Uh, and uh, and they, they helped me with uh, grant applications. It's the same thing. Um, and uh, so, so that's how, how it is. Working. It's an art. And you know, I have, a smile, I have a smile on my face because uh, I, I really enjoyed and I really appreciate and I really learned from, from this guy that, uh, these guys that uh, I, I consider them as my mentors. Or they are my mentors. They are the best. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm extremely proud and uh, very, very grateful for the, for the opportunity. 
yeah, uh, it's an art, right? To to write a paper and yes. Uh, yes. and they master that art. Um, so I myself have the privilege to to uh, had the privilege to work with Professor uh, Laporte twice, and I I know how interesting those iterations <laughs> back and forth can be. But uh, yes, uh, you you learn but at, at well. first. But at first. When you write your very first paper and you never published internationally before, you don't know what to expect. And then uh, it comes back once, is that all right? It comes back twice, okay, something wrong, and three times and four times, and it doesn't stop coming and you say, what's wrong with me? But there is nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with the paper, but it's getting better and better every time. And uh, in all the papers it happens like that until one day one of them told me look if i write something and tomorrow i have to revise it i will rewrite it completely it's it's just that the ideas are now better chained and uh, i I find new ways to present the things more logically more convincing and so on so and this is something i tell my my students now uh when when we were going to write our first paper i said look this thing is going to happen, all right? It's going to be like this. No matter how good or how bad the first draft is, it's going to take 15 iterations <laughs> until, we, until we think of submitting. So it's, a, it's, it's an experience, it's another experience. Yes, every comma and every point from the references too. <laughs> the reference, this, this is something I learned uh, from Joubert. This, is, this comes from Joubert, and uh, my students call me crazy about the reference. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the maniac for the reference list. It has to be perfect, but uh, yes, it has to be perfect. There is a way to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, no matter how many times you look at the list, you always find something else. You always find uh, a comma or a hyphen or, or this and that. And uh, this, I learned from Joubert. This comes from him. Yeah, so you you had the uh, you know wonderful experience of working with them, and it's reflecting now in your uh, way of of supervising and guiding your students for sure, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I try to replicate mm-hmm. this uh, type of uh, knowledge transfer. Everything that they they did to me, uh, everything that they taught me, and uh, the way I. The way that I perceive that I have uh, learned these things, I try also to, to apply it to students. Yes, definitely. Right. Uh, going a little bit technical now. Uh, what do you, what did you actually do uh, in terms of models and algorithms in your PhD for the inventory routing problem? We started uh, easy. Well, easy at the time it wasn't at all easy, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, <laughs> You model, you implement the model, and you tell a computer software to solve the model for you, right? Easy. Um, except that you don't tell the computer software everything in advance. But uh, sometimes you take something out of this software and you analyze whatever it gives you, and perhaps you give it another piece of information, right? Mm-hmm. We know it as branch and cut. But, uh, it's uh, when you do it for the first time, implementing these sub two elimination constraints. It, it's not trivial. It's, when you do it for the first time, it's complicated. You might think you understand looking at the paper, but go implement it for the first time. So that's what we did first. And then um, in, the, in my first paper, in our first paper, what we have is an, uh, is a neighborhood search algorithm in which we decompose two types of uh, decisions. Uh, the neighborhood search algorithm looks for routes, vehicle routes, over the several days of the planning horizon that you have in inventory routing. And once you have these routes fixed, um, we designed an algorithm that could optimally determine quantities and uh, inventory to be kept at each one of the sites and quantities to be delivered in each one of these periods. And this could be done exactly. And this could be solved in polynomial time. Ah, okay. polynomial so this is a mean cost uh, network flow mm. algorithm that you solve for each solution of your neighborhood mm-hmm. search mm-hmm. that determine vehicle routes. Can be time consuming, right? So this was the, the first. 
Uh, yes, can be very time consuming to implement, but... Uh, and to run, I mean, it, it's also, if you're doing that for every neighborhood uh, search... Yeah, but uh, it, it's uh, because of some particular structure of the problem, uh, Jean-Francois convinced me that it could be uh, modeled as a mean cost network flow. Mm -hmm for which there are specialized algorithms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, no. Look, does not does not implement the, the model for that and the, do not ask mm -hmm. CITLEX to, to solve it for you, but implement it on the side. And it was my first implementation paper, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So at the time, it was a hell of a job. Uh, it worked quite well. Um, like that, you solve uh, your mean cost problem, and then you keep iterating between the neighborhood search and mean cost network flow. Um, it obtained uh, very, very good solutions and uh, don't ask me about the results, but <laughs> if you're curious, they are in the first paper on CNR. Uh, right. So that was my first paper. And what about the second one? In the second one, then we started investigating something uh, with, um, with the managerial side, you know, this thing of going to the practical side, to the to the application of it, to the implication in practice that uh, started appearing in my undergrad, then it it came back during my career. And uh, in the in the second paper, what we investigated was the consistency of the solutions. So, given a, a, a solution, or given an, uh, you want to design solutions that are somehow consistent. Uh, for example, you want a customer to always be visited by the same driver. You want some sort of driver consistency, or and then we designed other types of a consistency. We implemented all of them, so we wanted an algorithm to find solutions that respect driver consistency, or you want an algorithm to to create solutions that respect quantity consistency. You want to, your customers to always receive the same amount of uh, products every time you visit them, and so on, so on, so. On. And then we compared the solutions in terms of cost, in terms of average inventory level, in terms of uh, average number of uh, visits and, uh, and, and things like that. So it was some sort of a more managerial paper. Uh, I assume you finished your PhD with three papers or uh, I'm wrong? In, in my thesis, in my thesis I have Good question. I think I have five papers in my thesis. Wow. Yes, I have a literature review and I have um, four algorithms. Yes. And so what did you do next for the thesis to, to complete it? Then uh, we, we investigated some other techniques to solving this problem by branching cut. We designed new valid inequalities for this problem. Some of them are still used today. Um, we investigated some, um, some some nice technical things that uh, we are still we are still we are still investigating these days, such as it's very counterintuitive the first time you, you look at it. But uh, you know you have in, a, in an instance, whatever whatever instance of a vehicle routing problem. So you have your depot and you have uh, 50 customers with uh, the demands and their locations. If you take customer 49 and you decide to call it customer 2, and whatever was customer 2, you call it customer 49, it can change the performance of the method. There is a reason for that. It's counterintuitive, but there is a reason for that. And uh, we investigated what what is the sequence of the input data that I should give the algorithm in order for it to perform best. Um, so we started investigating it. It appears in a paper in my thesis, and up to this day, we are still doing a, a paper <laughs> on the, on this topic with uh, with other people. Yes. Um, then uh, we have um, what else did we have? Well, the, the literature review paper. Mm -hmm. uh, that one was uh, quite long to get accepted, but finally it's published in uh, it was published in Transportation Science. And it is uh, my best cited paper yeah. up to this day. Great. Uh, so we are talking about four years of research, three years after you did the courses? Um, yes, two, two and a half years of, uh, of research. So 
five papers uh mm -hmm. you produce five papers material for five papers in two and a half years yes did you sleep so your course when you're of courses where you don't do research and then two and a half years of uh, research where we we wrote uh, five papers but i mean you you had to learn uh you know the the you how to implement heuristics and not only how to implement how to implement it effectively and then you had to learn the exact stuff and to, to get to the stage of uh figuring it out and developing valid inequalities and implementing all of them writing a survey paper uh as i asked just now uh, did you did you have time to sleep or did you did you were, were yeah, you sleeping like, like i said like i said before um it's not easy it's not easy uh, it's hard work, it's dedication, it's uh, support, different types of support, you know, support from the family, support at home, support at the lab, support from your supervisors, to, you know, and the, all these things together supporting you, then uh, you you have to commit to it. But, uh, once all these pieces are in place, uh, it happened. And then I finished. Uh, I had uh, I had my thesis ready at the summer, in two and a half years. It was um, it was quite interesting. We wanted to submit the thesis. We want to tell this. I want to defend, but it was the summertime. There was nobody there to receive the thesis, <laughs> uh, so we had to wait uh, for early early fall uh, to schedule everything and uh, to arrange for the defense. Ah, okay. And, uh, yep. Yeah, that is that is great, great achievement. And then you defend, you you present your PhD thesis, and what next? I defend. I had a very nice defense. Uh, the jury was very pleasant, very friendly. You know, some people have these bad experiences. Uh, I had this. Uh, I was uh, at peace. You know. Everything went smoothly. Um, I delivered a thesis. Um, I started a postdoc. So the deal, the deal, uh, the deal was uh, I wanted to submit my thesis. The thesis was ready by summer, right? So the deal was: look, I want to have the degree. I want to tell people I have the diploma. I'm ready to start working Monday morning, if it needs. Um, but uh, because I wanted to look for jobs, to apply for positions, and the uh, tell in the interview I'm ready you know I don't have this uh, PhD to finish I, I am a doctor uh, so I wanted to defend early but I didn't want to lose my scholarship because my scholarship w was uh, covered at least until the end of the year and then uh, Joubert said all right I'll, I'll hire you as a postdoc I remember precisely what he told me he said ideally you should not do a postdoc with your supervisor and he said and you learned everything I had to teach you. Come on, <laughs> impossible, right? What you're talking about? Yeah. But um, he he has a good point. Uh, when you when you do a postdoc, it's nice to have other other views, other mm -hmm. experiences, other collaborators. But he also understood my my point, and then uh, he hired me for a postdoc, six months. Um, uh, during the time, I applied for a few positions. Uh, I was look. I was offered a position in um, in another country on the other side of the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, they took me there for the for the interview. I did the interview. It was a position on um, on transportation, of course. Uh, I arrived late at the interview <laughs> due to transportation issues. Mm -hmm. I left my hotel. I, I knew what bus I needed to take, and so and so. I left the hotel with time to spare. I said, look. I can take one bus walk, so let's let's play it safe. So I left with time to spare to take one bus wrong. I took two wrong buses. <laughs> so I arrived late at the interview for a transportation position due to a transportation problem. <laughs> Did not start well. Um, they called me to offer me the position later. I said, uh, no, sorry, uh, not going to happen because our life was already in Canada, and my wife was here, and so um, Then uh, a position opened here in Quebec City, so I was in Montreal at the time. A position opened here, I applied. They called me for an interview. 
they were super nice to me. They offered me the position, then it was not moving across the ocean, it was moving three hours away from Montreal. They gladly accepted it. Uh, and then they wanted me to start quite soon. I think I, I, I had my interview in November and they wanted me to start in January. And I said, look, I just started a postdoc and we have so many open things, uh, so many ideas, things we wanted to do. Is it possible to postpone for a few months? So I start with you a bit later. They were kind enough to tell me, yes, go on. Build your CV, publish a few other papers. So I started in April, 1st of April. Uh, and uh, during that time, me and Joubert, we worked quite a lot in different different things. And then and then we had fun, you know. When uh, a postdoc is a time to, in my perspective, it's a time to have fun and to diversify and to try other things because you don't have to pressure anymore. It needs to work because I need a paper for my thesis. You, know, you already have a thesis. If your idea doesn't work, so what? You lost a few weeks. And then uh, we, we had fun. Lots of fun. We published a paper on solving Sudokus. <laughs> uh, yeah, one of these uh, crazy weekend ideas. Uh, we published a paper on solving Sudokus. Uh, there are journals that appreciate this type of things, like applying OR to design music. You know, it's yeah. the same journal, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, so they, they like these different things. And then, yes, we did it. Um, and uh, and then uh, that's it. And, uh, mm -hmm. A few months later, I started my position as an assistant professor here at the University of Laval. Yes, uh, that is 2013? 13, yes. Right. Uh, you spent some time in the Netherlands too, right? I visit the Netherlands quite often. Mm -hmm. I use it to go there two, time, two times a year. There, was, there were years I've been there three times. Um, it's a great collaboration I have with my colleagues there. Um, they, they, they allow me to collaborate with them in grant applications, in supervising students, and um, you know we I teach there. Uh, so we teach together. We share a course, and uh, so yes, I have a I have a position with them due to this uh, very extended collaboration uh, lots of their students came here to to do internships with me and uh, then again i used it to go there uh, quite often so not this mm, right but, uh, uh, yes i'm looking forward to it i, I really miss it <laughs> and and when did you get the chair position the chair the chair was 16 2016 so probably in 2015 the university announced they had an open chair so you have to understand how funding works here in here in canada so funding is very is, is, is very distributed not to the professor level it's not concentrated at the department or the university level it goes down to the professor so we apply for funding mostly from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. So they have, um, everyone in our field has an individual grant. Um, they are very stable, they are very straightforward, they support research steadily, and uh, when you get to this individual grant, it's for five years, so it gives you visibility of the money you're going to have, and then you can hire students and you can plan ahead. And depending on how you perform, in these five years, you apply for a renewal, and then you, you always have this grant. Based on the amount of, of money that universities get from these research councils, um, they, they get allocated what they call a Canada research. So this is money that comes from the federal government to fund a person in a position of, uh, of uh, say, excellence to do research so universities they have a given number of chairs based on the total amount of money that they get from these uh, councils and then from time to time they do a reorganization and the university either loses or gains a chair so 
we, we gained a chair. We, the university, had a, a, an open position. It was funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, meaning that anyone who is eligible to their grants, anything in natural sciences and engineering, um, could have it. And then uh, the university makes a call for the faculties to submit their best applications. And then faculties look around, and the uh, people who are eligible, there are a few rules. And then uh, we submit one or two. We, in, uh, I work in the business administration faculty. Uh, so we could submit one or two candidates. Engineering could submit, I don't know, five candidates, medicine one, and so and so. And then the university holds a, a panel to choose the best one. So they select one among these candidates. I was the selected one. They polish your application and they submit it to the Canada Research Council and they have the final call. So they make an external refereeing process. They ask for recommendation letters and so it's a, it's a very formal process. And uh, they have the final call if this person is going to be awarded a chair or not. So I was awarded a chair and then these chairs, the type of chair I have is a chair that is for five years with a half a million fund. Mm -hmm. So, this one comes to the university, different universities have different rules on what they do with this money. So, in our university, in our faculty, we, we allow, I have a reduced teaching load, basically, basically I pay the faculty, I buy out two courses with the funds from the chair, and I have some extra money to do research, other than my individual grant. So this is what the chair is, and then what it allowed me to, to do is to dedicate myself a lot to research. So I, I teach, I, typically we teach four courses during the, during the winter, during the fall. So I only teach two courses a year instead of four. Mm. I pay the, for the other two. And uh, this is time that I can dedicate to research, to supervise students, to have a more, more interaction with students, to publish and papers and, and so so this is research time so this is um this was something that really gave me lots of visibility gave me lots of opportunity in terms of time and uh, some extra funds also to hire more people and um, it, uh, it really 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 helped my career Yes. Uh, uh, so it was back in 2016 to answer your question. <laughs> that, that's great. I, I'm very thankful also for the explanation. I was about to ask you, in fact, uh, the importance and the meaning of the chair position, and you you clarified everything now. And I think that's uh, should be of interest of other people to understand how it works. And I assume at uh, at the same time that you you have a lot of res responsibilities uh, because uh, very few people uh, have. Uh, the privilege of having that position and how do you divide your time how do you organize your time uh, in terms of teaching and uh, research supervising people uh, meetings and I assume you you may have work with companies as well uh, can you frame or describe how how do you divide your time yeah so I teach two courses a year uh, now I I, I teach my two courses now in the winter, meaning in the summer and fall I don't teach. So it's a uh, full research. Um, now teaching and online teaching, it's uh, not, uh, not exactly fun, <laughs> but uh, we have to, well, everybody's on the same boat, right? Um, regarding my, my research, I have, uh, well, I, I supervise quite a few students. I always have interns from abroad, from Brazil, from Europe, um, have, I have interns from pretty much different, different countries. Um, and I have lots of practical applications, collaborations with companies, um, grants with an applied aspect, uh, collaborations with the different levels of government, public transport providers, um, companies, manufacturers, and so on. Um, and uh, this is nice here, they are open to collaborate with the university, they help fund the research, they help, uh, they put money and they put an effort, they put time 
in helping you uh, apply for grants from the government to, to solve practical problems. And uh, this is something, so again, this, this applied part, this uh, practical aspect that comes back to my career. And this is something that uh, takes a good chunk of, um, of my time. I'd say that uh, most of these collaborations we do do not end up uh, being seen elsewhere because we don't publish. Uh, we solve problems. Uh, I'd like to collaborate with the public transport provider. I know that uh, what they, they ask us to analyze and the things we do uh, have a direct impact on their performance, on how their buses are going to be routed tomorrow. So it's kind of a giving back to society, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, applying OR and applying analytical tools to solve practical problems. Uh, say uh, here we have uh, quite a lot of snow, so we have snow plowing operations that are quite time consuming. So we collaborate with the cities and uh, different levels of the government to optimize their snow plowing operations. This is an application of arc routing, and these are the techniques we we apply. But uh, this doesn't end up published, uh, but uh, it uh, ends up changing the way a city uh, operates their their fleet. So, in your opinion, what would be the appropriate outlet uh, for this type of results? Uh, you, you said, and we were talking the other day, that you spent quite a amount of your time uh, doing this type of practical work. I remember you told me about sometimes even 50% of your time some, uh, uh, in some situations. Uh, but yet, uh, we know you for your scientific work. I mean, not that is not, not that what you do with the companies are not scientific, but I'm saying, uh, you know what you publish through the traditional journals from our field. But, uh, we are like the, the people from the area. We know uh, that OR is important. We know, uh, you know the, the impact and etc. But if you're not able to show the society, I mean, you're, you're helping out, of course, uh, you're giving it back. But the, the, if you say like the, the general audience or, or the general public, they, they, not, they do not become aware. And even ourselves, we, are, we do the research, we are not aware of your practical work. So something is missing there, right? Uh, what are your views on that? Look, I think uh, even if I published uh, what we do with uh, public transport providers or snow plowing operations or production planning for a manufacturer, it would have to be completely reframed in an academic publication, in a scientific academic paper. Uh, and then uh, it, it was not done for that. That was not the goal. The goal was solving the problem and helping the company and saving, um, I don't know, a thousand liters of uh, diesel and uh, avoiding the emission of this many tons of uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, having the city be able to operate there is no plowing operations with uh, two fewer trucks, you know, and things like that. And this is what we do. We, we we give out this these results. They are happy. It works. Um, if I had now to take these solutions or these applications and write a paper out of it, it would take months. And uh, I don't think it, the the impact, the scientific impact, would be important because I didn't I didn't devise a new valid inequality to solve the arc routing problem. I, I didn't, you know. Uh, Scientifically speaking, I didn't create anything new to justify a publication. What's what's new in this publication? That's what the referees would ask. The referee two would say they are just applying the technique of to a new problem. Yes, that's exactly what I did. So if I try to submit, referee two would would uh, would reject it right away because of lack of contribution. But the, the contribution is elsewhere. The contribution is in the application. It's making sure that the technique that was developed using benchmark instances, it can really solve a practical problem. I don't think I'm ready to go through the effort of, uh, of this battle. You know, mm -hmm. There are journals that uh, appreciate applications. But they also take their own format and they have their own idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I think uh, with my my academic students, my PhD students, we can publish classical papers, let's say, mm-hmm. the papers that end up being published in uh, this uh, peer-reviewed closed form uh, journals. And uh, th- there is a different, uh, there is a different interest for these applications. The, the, they don't end up being published, but then when they invite us to a practitioner's conference and you go there and you say, I did this and this, and I help them save this many million dollars a year or one of, uh, you know, you talk to different people, even in classes, these this things are extremely useful in classes. You, you go to your undergrad class when you are teaching OR and you say, look, this thing here helped me save or avoid the emission of 50 tons of greenhouse gases. What I did, I applied this technique. What, what, what is behind it? Vehicle routing, branch and cut algorithm, or some else that we know from, from science. But yes, it has an impact in there. But uh, yes, indeed, uh, a, good, um, a good chunk of what we do don't end up being published. Yeah, um, but don't you think that this leads to a lack of visibility? Um, because people in general, all those that provide the funding, they're interested in practical solution, practical results, but our community are more, uh, of course, I'm not saying that is a right or wrong. It's just uh, uh, some uh, reflection I'm trying to bring in this case. Uh, this also affects funding, you know? Uh, so, okay, you were doing, you were, you were developing a value inequality, you were devising an efficient dynamic programming. You were doing now very good pricing, uh, but uh, that's not actually put in practice. And how do you end up? Okay, that science you're advancing. That's awesome. We all like that. We all appreciate that. But how do you find a, the appropriate balance to get uh, to the society to understand? Uh, you know, to the funding. Uh, uh, you know, agencies to to be aware of our work. You know, maybe we are losing a little bit of space, I don't know, to, to other type of uh, ideas uh, that are more fancy or, you know, they, they have Trendy, yes, trending yeah. and maybe more Maybe we are, maybe we are, but at least here in, uh, here in Canada, our funding agency, they are very clear that uh, convicts me of what are your contributions. They don't take for granted that your contributions have to be in the form of papers. Most of them are. But uh, they give you the chance to tell them what are your contributions. And uh, all these collaborations that I told you about, they are all duly signed with uh, the university. So it's a research contract and the money passes through the university. So I have, uh, I have all, the, all the paperwork to demonstrate that, yes, I collaborated with this many companies. Yes, I acquired this many million dollars of, uh, of funding for practical research. And uh, in the final reports, we demonstrate what was the contribution. And then the contribution is sometimes not a paper, but practical result. Um, this, um, this is accepted uh, in, our, in the rules of our funding programs. This type of thing is accepted. Um, and uh, perhaps this is one of the reasons that uh, allows me to do that to dedicate some of my time to not publish papers, but to solve these problems. And uh, I have to say, it's very nice to get an acceptance letter by email for a paper, but it's also very nice to solve this problem and uh, to go back to the company and present to them the, the results of uh, your analysis and uh, your, your suggestions and uh, put on these numbers to quantify the, the gains for them. It's also very nice. Right. Yeah. Uh, this there are not many uh, people from our field that actually doing uh, uh, this amount of practical work you were doing, um, and uh, it would be great if we have uh, some type of uh, outlet that we have access to the main results, uh, and uh, that also you can use in, in as you said in, in when you we teach and, and all that. But maybe we're sometimes too too much like paper oriented i don't know um among ourselves and uh, mm-hmm. maybe we we 
like we oh well, uh, we published a paper there in the in that journal that m may be more uh interesting than oh i saved uh half a million dollars working for that company maybe then your colleague won't oh, okay probably he just did some basic heuristic and got that and then you don't get maybe the and attention. perhaps it is and the, you know the the thing is it, there is nothing wrong if it's just some basic heuristics that work because companies they don't use or many companies they still don't use the basic tools so you don't need to create a fancy algorithm with new valid inequalities to solve your problem if you do it then perhaps it's easy to publish out of it but mm -hmm. perhaps you've just used some uh, basic algorithm existing models existing ideas that work uh for me it's uh, just as fun yeah right uh, so if one wants to work with you, Leandro, uh, it can be from Brazil or elsewhere. What is the protocol? <laughs> what do you recommend? Drop me a line. That's how that's how I am coming to Canada, right? By by sending out emails. Um, yeah. Drop me a line. If you have uh, you know, if you have your if I know your supervisor already, maybe pass through the through the through this person uh we, we already have a connection otherwise uh, just to demonstrate that we can do nice things together i'd be happy to have a look at it yeah you were telling me the other day that you have a lot of interest in uh having connections here in brazil right uh it's of yes. course you have uh i mean family around and you have a strong uh you know emotional relationship if you will with brazil so okay. yeah uh so maybe uh it would since you you left quite early uh i mean not early i mean you left in the right time for doing the phd but you left early uh, so the people could not meet you on you know just in time so uh maybe now you you can uh be able to maybe not be able to uh regain or start building up all this uh, networking with the with the guys around here that will be yes wonderful for, for I, us probably I, I very much look forward to it and uh, every time I go back to Brazil either for conferences or invitation or to visit my family I also try to visit university and meet new people so it was only recently a few years ago that I met uh, most of the OR crowd from Sao Paulo <laughs> uh, how come you never met these people yeah I never met these people never things never happened and then uh, i visited many universities there and uh, loved loved uh, chatting with this these guys and uh, having collaborations with some of them now things are moving forward we are working together um i, I really enjoy this and uh, i look forward to doing it uh, more with other people as well yeah the the funny thing is i jean francois cote that put us in contact and so <laughs> we had to rely on that when, when a canadian jean -Francois guy. was also there in montreal and uh, i was doing my phd we were we coexisted in the labs and now we are neighbors in the university so our doors are our neighbors uh, how is the experience of uh working with jean francois he can be a, he's a quite a character isn't he Yes, he's a character, but uh, he's a good one. We we, we co-supervise students. We have a few papers together. We we already graduated a few people uh, under uh, under our co co supervision. Uh, I like a lot uh, working with him. Yes, uh, I look forward to have the opportunity to work with both of you uh, anytime soon. Uh, Leandro, it was a great pleasure having you here. Uh, it is it is. It, is, it was wonderful to, to get to know your stories and how did you end up there. Uh, now now I'm, I can say uh, uh, that it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> some time ago, some t uh, years ago, I, I was puzzled and uh, I, I'm glad that, uh, to know how, how everything happened. Um, so yeah, I, Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the chat. Very nice. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, let's hope we can do some, some uh, collaboration as soon as possible. Let's work towards that. Thanks, Anand. Yeah, Leandro, bye. Bye-bye.